Hello, my name is Rasmus Bro from University of Copenhagen from the Chemometric and Spectroscopy Group. I'm going to talk about co-clustering uh, during this presentation and basically just give an overview of what can be done with co-clustering. Co-clustering is a method that allows you to find select areas of interest in a big data set. So unlike methods like, for example, PCA, we don't try to describe everything, but try to find the most unique and interesting patterns in data. And that can be of use in certain uh, situations. So in this talk, I'm going to exemplify how co-clustering co can be used and also show when it might not work as well as uh, one would prefer. The reason why we are interested in this is that we work quite a bit with metabonomics and in metabonomics we very often generate very, very information rich data where we can have thousands of variables and even tens or hundreds of thousands of variables representing maybe uh, less but still thousands of individual chemical pieces of information. And that's very complicated to look into. In fact, nowadays we tend to measure more and more metabolites or more and more information in general. But quite often we end up actually using much less than we used to because we try to find unique, sometimes even individual single biomarkers. So a lot of the multivariate advantage is lost because we end up selecting variables quite univariately. And that might be a pity. We have made a small little data set just to illustrate how co-clustering works. It's a nice data set because we can understand uh, what's going on here. You can see that we have different kinds of animals here. And we even included some funny uh, outliers here. A house you can see, for example. And then we have different variables. And these all reflect different aspects of these animals, whether they have eyes, how many limbs they have, if they eat meat. Uh, and we also included a random variable, again, just to have some bad information as well. Now, these are all assessed by me, so they are by no means uh, of high quality. But we, with this, we can actually generate a data set and it represents these animals with respect to these different features. You can note that we have both dummy variables here. We have very simple variables such as the number of legs and we have more quantitative measures like life expectancy or maximum speed. But all in all, it's a very simple data set. Well, if we do PCA on this particular data set, one of the first thing we will see is that the first component, PC1, really separates the birds from all the other ones. Now, if we look at the loadings, we can see that that does make sense. That, for example, variables has a beak and wings and walk on two legs are correlated to being a bird. So that makes perfect sense. Component number two, on the other hand, is a little bit more difficult to actually uh, get a sense of. In fact, we can take a look at all the components one to four. Now, if we look at them individually, component one, number one was the bird component, and that makes sense. But looking at component number two, it's very difficult to see what it is actually representing we have T-Rex, saber tiger, tiger, lion, as opposed to cow, shrimps, chicken. And in general, looking at all these components, most of them are quite complex to interpret. And this is even a fairly simple data set. Well, the problem might be that we are not really interested in how each and every animal is described by each and every variable. Probably what we are interested in is how select animals are loading on select variables. So how actually a group of animals 
are represented by a group of variables. And that sounds awfully much like clustering, but it's not quite clustering. And we can illustrate why it's not uh, as shown on this slide. Let's say as an example that we look at what kinds of papers I have published. I have published papers on fluorescence, on NIR, on PLS, on PCA, and on Raman spectroscopy. A fluorescence person would have published on EEM and also on Raman, whereas a process analytical technology person, a PAT person, would probably have published on NIR, PLS, and PCA. Well, if we do clustering on this, what we will get is that I will probably end up in a cluster together with the PAT person because we have papers in three different subjects in common. And then the two fluorescence persons might end up in uh, one cluster. And that means specifically that I cannot be in the fluorescence cluster because I'm already in the PAT cluster. If we take a look at co-clustering, Co-clustering allows different people to be in different groups. So for example, we could make a fluorescence cluster, and in that cluster there would be me and the two fluorescence persons. And only those variables that are relevant for fluorescence, so EEM and Raman. Then on the other hand, we would have a PAT um, cluster, and I would also be in this, but only loading on the three variables relevant for PAT, NIR, PLS, and PCA. Well, bear with the example, it's not really strictly very uh, correct, uh, but just to illustrate the concept of co-clustering. So this is what co-clustering it does. It allows different samples to be in different clusters, and it allows these clusters to be defined by only a few select variables. This is not something new. In fact, this has been around uh, since the 70s. Uh, but only recently have the algorithms actually improved to an extent where it's more manageable to, to make good models. There's been a lot of algorithmic problems, uh, problems with local minima, etc. Uh, but it seems that the algorithms are now slightly better than they used to be. So how can we actually solve this? Well, one way of looking at it uh, that we will use here is to consider co-clustering as a bilinear problem. So imagine that we have our data set in X and we want to find a bilinear model, so a model similar to PCA. Only in this particular case, we will only have some of the loadings and scores being non-zero. So for example, if you look at the first cluster here, we can see that it has zeros on some of the samples and it also has zeros on some of the variables. So that means that only some of the samples are reflected by some of the variables. That's a co-cluster. So actually, we can represent co-clustering by a bilinear model where we have very sparse components, sparse loadings, and sparse score matrices. And in fact, we can solve it like that. We can solve it by trying to find the least square solution to a model where we impose sparsity. And I'm not going to go into detail with this, but this is one way of imposing sparsity on the scores and sparsity on the loadings. And we can see that there is an associated penalty that we can adjust. And by increasing this penalty, we increase the sparseness. So that means we get more zeros in our scores and loadings. There's an algorithm for doing this, and also this part I'm not going to go into detail with, but the algorithm tends to work well, uh, at least for uh, reasonable data. We'll get back to that later on. One of the very nice things about this particular algorithm is that we actually don't have to select the penalty lambda, because we can choose that automatically. We may be able to fine tune it, but we will find that in many cases we don't need to. We just select the lambda so that it in introduces a fair amount of uh, sparseness. All the examples that I'm going to show 
is using this automatic selection of lambda. So we actually don't have to worry too much about lambda for now. Let's get back to looking at our example data set. Well, we can do co-clustering here. And I'm going to start with a six co-cluster model. This is what it looks like. Well, let me take it uh, one by one. So we'll start with looking at the first co-cluster. Now, what is shown here is all the samples, all the animals that are not zero and all the variables that are not zero. So this first component is a bird component or a bird co-cluster. The next one would be old animals of some sort. So that makes perfect sense. Then we have the third co-cluster, which is animals living in-house or being eaten or something close to that. And the next ones are co-cluster number four would be dangerous animals, which tends to be a little bit correlated to being big. The number, the variable 100 kilograms is small, reflecting that it doesn't load very much on that, but a little bit. The next co-cluster is fish stuff or water stuff. And then the next one would be big animals in general. And notice how different animals can actually load in different co-clusters. And likewise, different variables can load in different co-clusters. So we have the ability to have overlapping clusters or co-clusters. One very nice and important aspect of this particular algorithm for co-clustering is that the solution is nested. Not in a mathematical sense, but from a practical point of view, it is so that a two-component co-clustering result would almost always be similar to two of the co-clusters in a free co-cluster co uh, model. So for example, if we try to fit a one co-cluster model, we see that it is reflecting the birds. If we try to do a two co-cluster uh, co model, we see that we still get the bird one. Not exactly the same as before, but the interpretation would be more or less the same. The other co-cluster here is not really sparse, so it's probably something that's describing the overall phenomenon. If we do three co-clusters, we still get the birds, and then we get another uh, co-cluster, the domesticized uh, animals or something to that effect. And likewise, when we take the next component, and this thing with nestedness is very practical uh, when you analyze the data. This means that you don't have to worry too much about how many co-clusters to use. Simply use a reasonable number. So we took six co-clusters here initially, and it really wasn't for any practical reason, except we would like to look at the six most important co-clusters. We could have chosen seven or five, and we would have gotten more or less the same interpretation. Which is what this slide is telling us. Another thing that is important is what happens when we have irrelevant variables. Quite often, especially in modern data, we can have a lot of information which might not be relevant for the problem we are interested in. Well we can try to add random variables. So instead of just having our original 17 variables, we also add 30 random numbers or 30 variables with random numbers. Now, if we do co-clustering on that, and here's a seven co-cluster model, we see that we get more or less the same result as before. Not exactly the same, but more or less. So for example, we get a new one here, co-cluster number five, which seems to be flying things that are not birds, as opposed to this one, which is birds. We also get a component which is not at all very sparse, quite similar to what we just saw. Well, it seems that sometimes, especially when we have a lot of random variation, some, not necessarily just one, but some of the co-clusters will tend to describe the variation in the data. So they're not sparse at all, but they're mainly trying to describe 
the overall variation in the data. And that is probably what this one is doing. Okay, so adding 30 variables worked quite well. Let's try and add 300 variables. If we do that, again, we see more or less the same as before. In this particular co-clustering model, we have two co-clusters that are describing the overall variation, and then we have three sparse ones, which are the ones we are particularly interested in, the ones that are easy to interpret. So that actually also works. This is all very, very nice. But there are actually cases where this co-clustering doesn't work as well as in this particular example. One example shown here is when we have very non-quadratic data. Here we have some gene data. Uh, we have 56 samples and we have 12,000 genes or gene expressions. So it's a 50 by 12,000 matrix. And when we try to do co-clustering here, well, the co-clusters actually make perfect sense. It's also a fairly simple uh, data set and not too difficult to cluster anyway. But when we look at the genes, there's no sparsity. And that's not what we're interested in. We really would like to have sparsity also in the gene uh, mode. But it turns out that when you have very, very many variables compared to the number of samples, it's difficult with this particular algorithm to get sparsity in the variable mode. Another situation where it's a little bit complicated to get sparsity is when we have continuous data such as spectral data. Uh, or in this particular case, illusion profiles. Doing co-clustering on such data, well, in this particular case, we get three different co-clusters. And what you will see when you look at the illusion profiles or illusion co-clusters is that they are actually not very sparse. This is not sparse. This is not sparse. This one is sparse. Likewise, when we look at the scores or the samples, we see that, well, this one has sparsity, but the other ones are not very sparse. It seems like it's difficult to actually get sparseness on a data set like this, and probably because the illusion profiles are so correlated by nature that it's very difficult in a meaningful way to impose sparseness. So maybe it's the wrong question, in fact, to ask for a co-clustering representation of data like this. And maybe we would have to transform the data, integrate the peaks, for example, and turn it into a discrete data set before we could do meaningful co-clustering. Still, what remains is that it's a little bit difficult to do meaningful co-clustering on a data set uh, of this type. Overall, though, co-clustering is a very, very interesting method for looking into complex data and for finding very simple co-clusters, very simple uh, parts of the data that can be interpreted in different ways. It works especially on square data and especially if the data is non-negative. If we do have to center, then often there can be problems with local minima uh, and that is something that one has to consider when analyzing the data. If you want to try co-clustering, we have algorithms available on our website where you can download it and play with it in MATLAB. And there's also a paper shown below here uh, where you can read more details about the things that have been uh, explained uh, during this presentation. Thank you.